This is a beautiful space. It's good to be amongst people who have come together to worship the Lord in this space. How many of you were here while this church was being built? How many of you were here while this church was building its new addition? So you understand building and foundations, the mess that it is, the piles of dirt and the piles of materials and all of those different kinds of things that go into building. And as you've been walking through this series with your pastors, Jody's been preaching, Steve's been preaching, Perry's been preaching, as you've been walking through this series on the Sermon on the Mount, it's been building to this point about building. And you understand that. And I'm so privileged to be here amongst you who under, are learning about this right now because this is an impactful message for each of our lives, not only at this moment, for all, but for all of the rest of our lives. It doesn't matter whether you're young or it doesn't matter whether you're old. Jesus is talking in this passage that we're going to look at in just a moment about foundations, where our lives are built upon, and you're going to see through this text again, because it's a familiar passage, many of you have seen it before, over and over again, perhaps, but you're going to see in this passage the opportunity, the privilege, the invitation, the challenge that we have to build our lives on something that is lasting and stable. So we're going to start with a little video that helps to set the tone, and then I'm going to read the passage to you. Can you do that for us, please? Thank you. So the passage that that cute little movie video comes out of is Matthew chapter 7. And if you have your Bibles and you would like to read along with me, I'm beginning with verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 29. Jesus is speaking, and he says this, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Here ends our reading for the day. 
Jesus has been teaching through these three chapters, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7, how we can best live our lives. God incarnate has come to earth to show us the way, not just speaking through the words of the prophets any longer, not just think, speaking through Moses anymore, through Deuteronomy and, and Exodus, the Ten Commandments, but speaking to us from his very own heart and his very own mouth. And he's doing some upside-down teaching here, some inside-out teaching. What he's saying is don't just live by the rules, the laws anymore. Don't just live, live by the have-tos. Don't just live by the way that it looks good on the outside, but live by the motivations that come from the inside. Live on that firm foundation of my teachings that say murder, anger is like murder that says lusting in your heart is like adultery, it's equal to, that says don't hate your enemies, pray for them. Pray for those who persecute you and bless them. Who says the poor in heart is going to be blessed? Who says the meek, the servant, those who are willing to take the lowest positions are going to be those who will experience richness and blessing in life. He's turning things inside out and upside down. And this is the same reality that we actually have today. We learn to sit up straight. We learn to get good grades and we will be successful. We learn to get a college education. We learn to drive the right car, own the right house, have our children behave the right way. We learn to dress in the right apparel that says we fit in. We learn, we learn, we learn, we learn so that on the outside we look good. And nobody really knows what's going on on the inside. And Jesus is saying, pay attention to what's going on in the inside and listen to my words because I am teaching you how to live from the inside out. I'm teaching you what the real motivations are. are. I'm teaching you what love looks like. I'm teaching you what sacrifice and service looks like. I'm teaching you what true joy and blessing looks like. Listen to my words, but don't just listen. Believe them. Stand on them. Make them a firm foundation in your life. So that when storms come, when floods come, when rains come, when winds blow, so that when that happens, you will still be standing. Now you understand floods here in this part of the country. 2008, the Cedar, Rap the Cedar River overfloods its banks, and takes over downtown Cedar Rapids. And Marion and Cedar Rapids experiences a storm as a community, perhaps unlike you've ever experienced in your personal life. Cedar Rapids and Marion, you watched on the news, and perhaps it was your home, or perhaps it was a friend's or a family member's home. Perhaps it was your business. Perhaps it was the hospital where you work. You watched, and you cried, and you felt one another's grief as you saw the things that were being battered by the storm. You understand storms. Do you understand storms, natural storms, Mother Nature storms? But perhaps you also understand personal storms, relational storms, financial storms, health storms, economic storms, education storms, addiction storms. Perhaps you also understand those storms. And as Jesus is stating in this, in this parable and talking about storms and talking about foundations, he's saying something that's really quite interesting in comparison and contrast because he's comparing the wise person and the foolish person. He's saying there is a wise way to do it and there is a foolish way to do it. But listen to this. They both get storms. Everybody has storms. Isaiah reminds us in chapter 55 of his letter that the rains fall on the just and on the unjust. They happen. It's a part of life. And you don't have to be very old to experience that. I was 18 years old when my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and she was given a 40% chance to live. And I thought, 
well, my mom's going to make it because she's a godly person. She loves the Lord. She is faithful. She is full of hope and faith and joy. And she's going to make it because she's on God's team. And my dad said, mm, honey, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, and life is not fair. And I said, yes, it is. Life is what you make it. You work hard, and you're a good person, and you get great results. Life is what you make it. And then my mother died. And I realized that life isn't always fair, even when you're the one who thinks you're making it. And I was on shifting sand. I needed a new foundation. Storms happen. It doesn't matter who you are. They're a part of life. A friend of mine was going through a very difficult se season. It was a long season. Ever had one of those? In a long season? Difficult, long season. And she said to me one day, we're in about year four, maybe we were into five by then, she said to me, I just want things to be normal. And I said, I'm pretty sure this is normal. We actually, if you will peruse your life, we hang on to the good things. We need them. We need those memories. We need those experiences to get us through the storms. But if you assess your life just real quickly, blip, 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 in your own mind, in your own mind Many of us will realize that we've had more storms than we have had sunny weather. It's one of the reasons we like the sunshine so much, especially in this part of the country. It's one of the reasons that we like when we hit smooth sailing, that we get to bask for a while, get a tan, lay out in the sun, not worry about things. But there's always a storm brewing. Don't you hate that? I get an amen on that one. Don't we hate that? There's always a storm brewing. Storms happen. You know, sometimes there, we, did, we did that storm. Sometimes that storm is our fault. And sometimes we're so hard on ourselves that we're like, bring the wind, bring the waves. I deserved it. I did this. And I'm going to have to face the consequences of it, and it's just going to have to be what it is. And we're so hard on ourselves because we caused this problem in our lives. And we don't realize that there's actually a different foundation to stand on. And that the Lord is actually willing to move us from that foundation that we built that is shifting sand to the foundation of his word and his truth, his power, his love, his guidance, his influence in our lives. You have the perfect physical example of this in your own community. I couldn't believe it. Jody was giving me a tour of Mary and Cedar Rapids yesterday. And as we were going down to the river, and I wanted to see the railroad tracks that had collapsed because I had watched this in 2008. Like, show me, the, show me where the railroad tracks were. Let me see the hospital that was underwater. And, and we drove into the little Czech village and looked at the Czech museum. And Jody said, that Czech museum used to be over there. Well, how many square feet is that place? I don't know, like Google it, somebody get your phone out. Maybe 80, 80,000 square feet, do you think? That place is massive. What is it, four stories high? And they moved it? They moved it from one shaky foundation to a stable foundation. That's what we get to do. We get to move from that shaky foundation that perhaps we built, and we built with good intention, and we built because we wanted to do it ourselves, and we built because, man, we can make it happen. And we're finding out that it didn't work. And we get to move from that foundation, even though we may be the one who built it. We don't have to pay the consequences for that anymore. Jesus did this for us. We get to move it from that to his foundation. I have a friend who did this. He's a self-made millionaire. And by the time he was 40, he had everything he'd ever wanted. His life was perfect in every American dream kind of way. He had more money than he needed, didn't have to work a day in his life, but he loved his job. He enjoyed getting up in the morning and going to work. 
He had a wife that he was crazy about, madly in love with. They'd been married for years, several decades. Life was stable for them. He loved her more than the day that he married her. He had three beautiful children who were healthy, who were vibrant, who were alive, who were doing well in school. He loved his home. He loved his community. He loved his church. He loved everything about his life. And he said to me, you know, I thought by the time I got to this place that I would be happy. And look at my life. I have everything I've ever wanted. I don't have to work a day in my life. I love my wife, my children, my home, my community, my church. I love everything. And I look at it and I say, is this it? Now, some of you are thinking, well, just let me try that. I'm willing to find out if this is it. But he was there, and he knew, God, there has to be something more. What is it? And we talked, and I listened to him. And he was a Christian. He'd been a Christian for 30 years. But he was still playing on both foundations and it was beginning to shake. And he realized that he had built his own empire, and it was fabulous, but it wasn't enough. There was something just hollow, lacking, empty. And he realized that what was lacking was that he loved all of that more than he loved the Lord. And so he asked me if I would pray with him and for him for as long as it took to build his life on the rock of Jesus Christ instead of all of this stuff that he'd been able to build under his own power. And I got to watch my friend be transformed as he fell in love with the Lord in ways that exceeded everything else he already had. And he went from being a person who was driven and proud and egotistical, still kind and wonderful and lovely, but it was about him and his stuff, to being a person who now builds hospitals and schools and helps his community in any way that he can. And he's not using his money just on the inside of the church. He's using his money mostly on the outside of the church because he realizes that when we're built on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, our motivations isn't just to be good to the good people. Our motivation is to be loving to everyone. That's what Jesus said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? The cranky old person. We had somebody cut down our lilac tree so that they could build themselves a fence. That wasn't very pleasing. She was a cranky old neighbor. We had a tree that was dying and it needed to be cut down or it was going to fall into their yard or ours. And she was livid that there might be a branch that falls on her little pretty plants. And it was February. I don't think those plants were going to mind too much. I, you know, we have neighbors, right? Are you going to love your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? Love your neighbor as yourself, but you've got to love yourself first. And we don't get to do that very well until the foundation of our lives is built on Jesus Christ. Everybody has storms. Everybody's building a life. In this parable, everybody was still hearing the word. It was the same word that those who are foolish and those who are, are wise were hearing. They were all hearing the word. But they weren't leaving and saying, that was nice. That was a good word. I think I'll think about that word. Hmm. I think I'll compare that word to a whole bunch of other words. I've been studying world religions. I've been studying philosophy. I've been listening to all of these great minds. And I'm just going to lay them all out and evaluate all of them. And then I'm going to go, eeny, meeny, I'm going to pick that one. No, he's saying, don't just hear these words and walk away and think about what you might want to maybe perhaps do with them later. But build your life on them. That's the only difference. They both want to build a life. They both have storms. They both hear the word. The difference between the wise and the foolish 
is that the wise builds his house on the foundation of Jesus Christ and the foolish on the things that they would prefer. This is a smart life. A wise person builds a smart life. And you've been going through this series, Get a Life. You've been talking about how do we get a life. Jesus is summarizing all of that up in these simple few verses, how we get a life. And the metaphor of life, the game of life, take a spin, that's where the metaphor breaks down for us because who wants to just spin and it's like playing roulette and see what happens? No, we want to be intentional about this. We want to make good things happen in our lives. And then when we find out it doesn't, we need to move our foundation from that, just like the Czech Museum, to the words of Jesus Christ. Don't just hear them, apply them. This is a smart life. And so the title for this sermon get a smart life is actually an acronym, S-M-A-R-T. I looked up the word smart in the dictionary, hoping I would sound smart, and what I heard, saw, read, was that smart is about intellect. But it goes a little further than that. It's not just about whether or not you can pontificate and sound smart and use the right words, but it's how you apply it in your life. Taking what you know, your knowledge, your understanding, and doing something with it. That's a smart life. So if we're going to build our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ, what does smart look like? It looks like this. A smart life is a spirit-led life. Jesus said, it is good that I go away to his disciples. And they're thinking, um, no, it's not because you're the Messiah, and if you go away, then we won't become the rulers of the world like we are supposed to, and our enemies won't become our footstool that they're supposed to, and everybody won't know that we're great if you go away. It's not a good idea, Jesus, if you go away. And he's like, no, actually, it's a good idea. Because if I go away, then the Holy Spirit will come. And from the inside out, he will remind you and teach you of everything that I have ever said, and he will be your guide, and he will be your comforter. It is good that I go away. And Jesus was so excited for them to have the Holy Spirit that after the crucifixion and the resurrection, he shows up in the upper room where the disciples are hiding. Well, the first thing he says is, don't be afraid. Isn't that a little weird to anybody? Like, I'm sorry, you just walked through a locked door and you're going to say, don't be afraid? And the second thing he says is, peace be with you. And the third thing he does is he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. He couldn't wait for them to get the Holy Spirit. It's so good. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. But that wasn't enough, not just to receive the Holy Spirit. He wanted them to have the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he says to them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes and anoints you from on high with power. They didn't even know what they were waiting for. Jesus said, wait. By the way, they were waiting in the danger zone. The chief priests, the religious rulers, were looking for them, trying to squelch this movement who were claiming that the Messiah was alive, something we get to, we get to celebrate in just a few weeks. He's alive. A smart life is a spirit-led life that is motivated by the teachings and the life of Jesus motivated to apply, not just hear, apply. To apply the words of God and to rely on them. To apply and to rely on his truth, trustworthiness, and timing. Truth and trustworthiness, if you've been a Christian long enough or gone to church long enough or read the Bible long enough, are things that we understand. It's Christian language. Truth and trustworthiness. God is truthful. God is trustworthy. I build my life on his truth. But timing, 
We like to be in charge of timing. I write my calendar. I drive through Starbucks and get my coffee, and I want it now. Happy meals, lunchables, all of these things that make our lives fast and convenient. We're in charge of time. I can text my friends while I'm sitting anywhere, and maybe you have already right now in this hour. I can check the news anytime I want. I got it now. Time, time, time. Time matters. Time is money. Time. And we're making char taking charge of our time and taking control of our time. And do we realize that the Lord has a timing that exceeds every other timing? It's not just trusting him, and it's not just his trustworthiness. It's not just building our lives on his truth, but it's waiting in his timing. And in my short life, I have experienced over and over and over again when I've botched it because I got in a hurry and when I've seen what he was up to because I trusted him long enough to wait. And I want to leave you with that thought because this is a familiar parable to us. I want to leave you with the reminder that building your foundation isn't something that has to stay that way. Even if you've built a beautiful empire, it might not be enough. You get to move your house onto the foundation of Jesus Christ. You get to let his spirit lead you to make the right decisions. You get to let his spirit lead you to know what is good for you, for your family, for your situations, the positive situations and the negative situations, your health issues, your financial issues, your relational issues, whatever they are, the Spirit is there to lead you and to apply his leading, his teaching to your life in such a way that you are now firmly on the foundation of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord to you. And as we go home and assess our own lives, remember, your foundation, while it may be good, it's crumbling. The foundation of Jesus Christ, the rock, the fortress, the redeemer, is always stable in every circumstance. I'm going to end with this one thought. The timing of this sermon for me has been really powerful in preparing. Because while I know all of this is true, and I've got stories from my own life that this is true, right now I'm experiencing another storm. And it's good to be reminded that it's true. I found out on Tuesday that I have breast cancer. And I meet with the surgeon tomorrow. And I can stand before you, and I can say, I stand on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. And he is with me through this next storm of my life, just like he is with you through yours. And if you will trust in his trustworthiness and his timing, the truth of his words, you will experience that foundation even though the house may be battered by the storm. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we are in awe that this is who you are and this is how you work in our lives. Lord, as we assess our own lives, those of us who are on your firm foundation not only celebrate and say thank you, thank you, thank you, but may, may we be living testimonies to those who are struggling and searching and are on unstable, shifting ground. And then I pray, Lord God, that the firmness of your foundation will not only be meaningful for our lives, but meaningful for others, that as we love you, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves, they will hear and they will know and they will receive this for them. Lead us, Holy Spirit, that we would be motivated to apply and rely on your teachings, your trustworthiness, and your timing. In Jesus' name, amen.